Good afternoon. Any questions? How was your weekend? Probably better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually probably true because I was doing homework all week. Exactly. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> you probably learned more than I did. Um, probably. It's hard to learn when you're already smart. Uh, all right. No questions? All right, then I will have a couple of few questions. Um, so, um, so I have a couple questions about your reading. So go ahead and um, l look at today's batch of clicker questions while I put them into Piazza. Oh, of course. Yeah, like I need spring break. I need. No, I mean, yes, but that means like it's closer, right? It's closer. Yeah, we're closer and closer to summer. Yeah, closer to summer. Oh, that's terrible. I turned 21 first. Oh, 21. First day. Where are you going? Nowhere. I'm going to do that. It's Thursday. I mean, not on the day of the day, because you can, like, celebrate. Maybe, yeah, because it is the 24th. You can celebrate it, like, after time. Yeah, so I, I literally told anyone that everyone that, hey, my birthday is the 24th this year. Get over it. Yeah. All right, so if you could please answer this question. stuff. Feel free to move on to the other questions.
All right. So, let's see how people voted on this one here. So most people chose option four with a smattering of the others. So the, the constructor doesn't have a syntax error. That's just a job on how you invoke the superclass constructor, right? So rectangle has a constructor with four parameters. And so here we're passing them to the superclass constructor. Now, interestingly, four people thought that a class, this class must have instance fields or methods. And that's not so, right? You can have a class that has no fields and a class that has no methods. So if you, even if you have no constructor, you could just say class friend, and it'll compile. It'll not do much, but it'll compile. It violates the law of the meter. What was the law of the meter? Don't give out your liver. Don't give out your liver, right? Now this, so that can't possibly apply because this thing's not giving out anything. So it violates the Liskov substitution principle. What's the Liskov substitution principle? So you need to be able to, where you expect a rectangle, you have to be able to hand a square. Right. So give me a situation where the Liskov substitution principle is violated. <coughs> so there has to be some context where the code manipulates rectangles, and now you give it a square, and some violation of some sort happens. Like if you were trying to set the height of a rectangle, it has can, to be the same. For can we system. set the height of a rectangle? You can for a rectangle, then the behavior. Well, let's let's have a look at Java AW to your rectangle and see what we can do with it. There's set bounds, there's set right. Ah, okay, that's good. So you, so you know those methods. So there's a set bounds method. So if I have a rectangle. <coughs> Or I get it from somewhere, and then, then I can call set bounds and say zero, zero, 150. That's legal for Java AWT rectangle. Now, if I were to do that for a square class, so if I now here say new square. It's certainly legal to, to make a square in the rectangle, right? That's what it means to convert to the superclass. But now I've turned it into a non-square. And so that's really bad, right? So this means that uh, this is just not an appropriate way of forming a subclass. And so in this case, you simply should not use inheritance. Um, even though the is a principle holds, right? Every square is a rectangle. Conceptually, so you know, square is a, is a rectangle. Of course, it is, right? But it is not every square is a Java dot awt dot rectangle, because the Java awt rectangle class has that feature that you can stretch them. And so, a square is not stretchable in that sense. So, it actually is not a rectangle in that sense. So, that's sometimes complicated to to envision. If the Java awt rectangle class was had been immutable, if it had been impossible to modify it, then this would have worked out okay. And so that's one more reason to prefer immutable classes. So this could work, uh, this could, this could compile. It'll compile, it'll run, and then it'll it'll give you an unwanted situation. Namely that you now have something that you consider a square that no longer is a square. Right, so I have now legally unmessed up the squareness. So that means that um, then this conversion, in which, you use, which works according to the law of language, it doesn't work according to the semantics of what a square is. And it is because I was able to mutate. If, if I had not had mutator methods, then this would not have worked, and then it would have been fun. So it's, it's, it's a subtle difference between what's a rectangle and what's a java.awt.rectangle. Because we don't ne normally necessarily, when we say every square is a rectangle, you know, sure, every square is a rectangle mathematically, because we don't think of a rectangle as something that, that, you, can <coughs> uh, that, that you can stretch. All right. 
So, moving on. So, I want to get at uh, the question. Um, in this section, this chapter, and in a, in a couple of chapters that follow it, there are a lot of fiddly examples. And uh, so, when, when you do the ple your pre class reading, I'd like to know to what degree you go through these. So, let's see. I think I've already answered this. So I have 13 votes, most of them correct. So, so answer A is a little bit nebulous, right? I mean, does, does it like call the mouse and check where it is? Um, it has. <coughs> we put it in this example, as we'll see in a minute when it goes through there, to, 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 to tracking the mouse movement. But, and of course, four is nonsense. So the question is, does it move to position x, y, or does it move by position x, y? And it is the latter, and that's what most of you said. So it looks like most of you do read this stuff, or at least you can guess very quickly. And so th then the, the other just behavioral question that I have, uh, and of course because I want to drive a certain behavior, is what do you do when you're asked to review these things that have a lot of code examples? That's interesting. Okay, then I'm just going to wait for all the answers. All right, so interestingly enough, the class is evenly divided, except the one joker who chose option D, um, is evenly divided between reading the code in the book and running the code. What do you think you're supposed to do? Both. Yeah, both would be good, right? Um, uh, but it, I think it really is kind of important to run the code. Because if I don't see that if you don't run, the, if you just look at the code, how that can tell you enough. These examples are complex and subtle, and so I would definitely want you to run the code. So each time that you need to read some of these sections before class, be sure to, to run the code and have some idea of what the heck the point of the code is. Um, and <coughs> it's not my book, uh, it's, but it's really, it's there a lot of programming books that you're gonna be reading in your career, uh, which, as I'm sure you realize, it is not over. I mean, this reading books is not over when you graduate, something you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. <coughs> um, and it's a very common thing for people who uh, write about a new technology to have kind of a running example that they develop. Like if you read a book on uh, doing web programming, for example, there, there's often something that does something with a, like a, a shopping list application or a quiz application or something that gets developed one chapter into the next, into the next, into the next with increasing complexity. And if you don't run the thing as you read the book, it would be very difficult to figure out what, what the author is after. And I'm not necessarily sure this is the greatest strategy when, when writing a book because people do honestly lose track of the various fine points that the author is trying to make. Um, I've written books both ways um, where I, I did these ever longer examples and then also where I've tried to just have the shortest possible snippet that shows <coughs> just this one point without piling more and more things into the same example. And the advantages and disadvantages to both. But so definitely when you see these examples in, uh, in this chapter, 
and then also in the next in the chapter on frameworks that we're going to be entering uh, next, uh, go ahead and sh just make a make a project. It only takes a few minutes and run it. And each time, ask yourself, well, what the heck is different from before? Because each of them looks slightly different, and they're all cars and houses and and stuff and shapes. But they, um, I mean, I find it confusing when when preparing for the lectures and. Uh, then when I figure out what's actually special about each of those examples, then it becomes much clearer. All right. Um, so let's go through, <coughs> uh, through the slides and more importantly, the sample programs. So this whole thing starts out uh, with inheritance. Um, inheritance is something that you are supposed to have seen in CS1 or CS2. Um, and so the way that we, we've been teaching it is in CS1, there's an introduction to inheritance with the idea that no one understands anything of it. Then in CS2, they do it again um, in the hope that this, the second time it becomes clear. And that's when we need it uh, when, because, of course, in Java, the, the collection classes are organized by inheritance. And now we're seeing it again with, uh, with many more variations that, that are oh, unsuitable for, for a beginning course. So inheritance is a modeling subclasses, modeling specialization. So here we have this manager has some extra method. Um, this manager, oh, the manager gets a bonus. That's that's what we're thinking. And so every employee is a manager, but not every manager is an employee. And so that's uh, where inheritance is uh, the right way to model this. Um, <coughs> So here you can see there's an added instance variable. Um, here's a new, uh, a new method set bonus. And then we need to override the get salary method because the salary is composed of the base salary and the bonus. So here from the inheritance diagram, you see this uh, very characteristic arrow here with the open hollow arrow tip. You can see the <coughs> attributes of the employee the manager adds another attribute and of course inherits these attributes. You see these methods here and you can see the get salary method occurs in both, that means it's overridden and the set bonus method here is added to the manager who does not belong. So that's of course a super artificial example just to show the mechanics in an, in an easy way. So that's one thing about the terminology. The super sub sometimes confuses uh, beginners. Why is manager a subclass? It sounds like managers are such superior beings, right? Um, so where does the super and the sub come from? And also, and just in terms of if you look at the objects, a manager object has more fields. It has the fields for the name and the salary and the bonus. So it has three fields, whereas an employee only has two fields. So it sounds like the manager is more bigger or um, but the, the terminology, the super sub terminology, comes from set theory, and so this is the picture that you should have in mind. You look at the picture, of, you look at all employees. That's a set, and that is a super set of the set of managers. The managers are a subset of the set of all employees. Every manager is an employee, but not the other way around. So if you think of set, set theory, super set, subset, that's exactly where super class and subclass uh, come from. All right, um, <coughs> so then here just shows an obvious thing that you can have an inheritance hierarchy, you can have sub-subclasses, and so on. I won't dwell on that. So here's this, the substitution principle that we just talked about that says that <coughs> whenever you have any code at all that involves an employee <coughs> and manipulates this in, in any odd way, then one can set E to a manager or a secretary or any of the subclasses of other employees. And in, it's not something that's foreign to us anymore because we've done this for interfaces all along. So we've now lived for like three weeks or so using interfaces and being able to make an object into a reference of something of a more general type is nothing new. In fact, that's one of the reasons I like to teach interfaces before teaching inheritance. Inheritance is technically somewhat more complex. You have to worry about what happens to like superclass construction or invoking superclass methods with superdom. With, uh, with interfaces, you never have that problem. And so interfaces are easy, and they're kind of the, the pure of the, of the notions. 
Um, but uh, whenever I try that in a CS1 textbook, um, all of the adopting professors, they shriek and say, you have to teach inheritance first. And I say, why? And because that's how we learned it, they say. Um, anyway, here we're doing it, I think, the more logical way. Um, <coughs> there are a couple of technical things that if you've had uh, inheritance in, uh, in your CS1 and CS2 that, that you know. Um, number one is um, if you want to access a private field of the superclass, you have no more access rights than anyone else. That means you have to go to the, to the uh, and use the public interface of the superclass. So over here I want to add the salary, the base salary that's defined in employee and the bonus that's defined in the manager and I can't do that. Instead I have to call get salary. So when I call get salary, that means this dot get salary. So I use a public method on myself to, to access the private uh, fields of the superclass. Um, except this still doesn't quite work. Um, the problem with this is that now this is a recursive call. And to overcome that in Java, you have to say super dot get salary. And thereby saying, I don't want to call myself. I want to call the get salary method of the super class. Yes? Um, sometimes I see in people's code, they make getters for things that are like not even public. Like, for example, for bonus, they might make a private get for a get bonus. Um, would you recommend that, or would you recommend a get? You mean here? Yeah, like, so for example, they call get bonus, and get bonus would be a private method. I don't see the point. Okay. No, I've never, in fact, I don't think I've seen that. I, I should say never, but no. I mean, if it's a private instance variable, why bother making a private getter? Right. So, um, I think I know where um, where I've seen it. Um, with, with where students do that, um, when you uh, override equals. Because the students are not always aware of the fact that when you override equals, that you can actually access the instance variables of the other object as well. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that when we come to equals. Um, so, now here's one important thing about uh, super. It looks as if super was an object reference somehow. But that's actually not the case. How do I know that super is not an object reference? So let's have a picture here. So let's say it was, right? To what object? So let's say I now have my manager, Max. then presumably if super was an object reference, it would have to be a reference to max. That's the only object that's set. But in that case, calling get salary works by the normal polymorphic invocation. Then you follow the reference, you see what's the type of this thing, it's a manager, so it would call managers get salary. Well, that's exactly not what it's doing here. This one you call employee get salary. So it's not a reference. Instead, this call really means to call get call super dot get salary on this <coughs> on the implicit argument, and it changes. So the, the the use of super is to change which method gets invoked. It's to turn off polymorphism. Normally, method invocation, like I say, you follow the reference. So, And you say, I want to call the get salary method on this thing. You object, now figure out which get salary to call. That's what polymorphism means. But in this case, we say, hey, you object, I don't want polymorphism. I know exactly which method I know I want to have called, namely the get salary method of the superclass. And so then for this method call, polymorphism is turned off. Note also that this use of super has nothing to do with, oh, I, I know I have. With this use of super, it's this, this, this is a different syntax for 
call a constructor of a superclass. This invokes a constructor. In general, in Java, there's only two ways of turning off polymorphism. Um, no, three. Four. All right, so there are four situations in Java when polymorphism is not used. So let me again be very clear what does polymorphism mean. Normally it means I want to call some method M on an object. Then polymorphism means when it asks the object, what is your implementation of M? And that can only be decided at runtime because you don't know until runtime what a reference points to. So turning off polymorphism means that we know at compile time which method is invoked. You've seen one case when that happens, namely Where's my super here? Namely, if I know exactly when this method gets compiled, what's going to be called. This one was in the manager class, so super is employee, so this is going to be compiled into calling employee. So I know this at compile time. Give me another situation where you know at compile time what method is called. Very good. Where the static method, right? When you have a static method like math.pow or something, <coughs> there's no inheritance. You know exactly which method gets called. Another situation. Where you know at compile time exactly what gets called. Yes, and we have one of the more. You know that this calls the constructor of square. Whenever you invoke a constructor, you know exactly at compile time what method gets it. There's no, nothing can change it wrong. And the fourth one is obscure. When you call a private method, it's resolved at compile time because you can't override a private method. And so there's no need for doing it in one. So those are the four situations. Um, super dot, static method, constructor, and a private method. All right, trivia factor of the day. Yeah, we have super class constructor. Um, so I do want to talk about this because uh, this will come up again on in Wednesday's lecture. So we don't often talk about preconditions, but um, yes, sometimes it's, it's a useful notion. So a precondition, remember, means that it is something that has to be fulfilled in order to have, have the method do the right thing. So when we look at employee.setSalary, employee.setSalary had a reasonable salary, uh, precondition, namely, that the salary should be greater than zero. Okay, no one wants to work for free or for paying money. Right. So can we change manager set salary precondition so that the salary has to be at least whatever, uh, seven figures? And the answer is you cannot do that. You cannot make a precondition more restrictive. Because if that was okay, it would be easily defeated. You could do the following. If you wanted to now have a manager and have them work for a low 50,000, you would construct the manager, you would turn it into an employee like this, and then here on this here, then presumably this precondition won't apply. And so you could never enforce such a precondition. There are several times when we're going to be running into the same situation that um, <coughs> when you have a restriction on the superclass, any restrictions on the subclass can be at most as strong. Um, I'll give you another example, in fact. Um,
double check if I have those here. Yeah. No. Okay. I don't. Um, what would it be nice? Um, there's a clone method that we'll be talking about in uh, chapter eight, I believe. Where? Um, so there is a way you can take an object and you clone. So in a class employee. <coughs> in the class manager, could I redefine clone like this? Um, no, that would violate uh, the substitution principle because consider the following code. So each of these lines of codes is perfectly legal, of course. Right? So you're constructing a manager somehow. Here I'm saying E is the manager, and now I'm saying F, F is, uh, as an employee, is E dot clone because this thing returns an employee. Now imagine that manager's clone, which here only promises to return an object, returns whatever, the watermelon. It's legal, right? The only promises to return an object. Then over here, this thing would return a watermelon because it is maps. But here I'm trying to assign it to an employee, and now my time system would be violated. So you cannot make this thing less restrictive here on the return time. What you can though do is you can make it more restrictive here on the return time. <coughs> So that one is okay. If managers, clones will only return managers, then we've not violated the substitution principle. Over here, this thing will return a manager, which is fine. Now, it's always confusing to people why on the input side here, on the parameters with the preconditions, we cannot make a stronger precondition. But on the results, we are allowed to make a stronger uh, restriction. And so in general, um, any restrictions that you put on the inputs work in the opposite direction as the ones that put the outputs. I don't want to belabor that any further, but it'll come up a couple of times again. And then I can say, well, we had this weird case before. And it's one of these things that one has to think through a few times. All right, so I don't want to talk about Post conditions, it just gets worse. All right, so a real quick thing here. So now we're putting inheritance to use with uh, with graphical user interfaces. Um, up to this point, we have done all the drawings on a uh, on a label that contained an icon, and that was just there because the way the book was ordered. That it started with interfaces. Icon is an interface, so I had it readily available. To draw on something the way a normal swing programmer would do it, so you would not actually do it. You would instead subclass J component and override the paint component method. Yes? Do we always need an icon on a J table? From now on, you will never need an icon again. So the icon was only there to, to get us to this point where we didn't have inheritance. So now you can forget the icons and the labels, and you can always just extend J component like this. It's not hugely different. It's just that you don't have to separate the icon and the label anymore. And the method is slightly different. You don't have the X and Y and the, the parent component. You just have the graphics. Does icon serve as a component? No, icon is not a component. Um, icon is that's just, it's an interface. 
Uh, it can't be a component, right? An interface cannot extend the cloud. So an icon is just there, it's just it's interfa an interface in its own right. An, an icon is a nice interface because it lets you do you know, both the drawings of those images and the drawings that we did freehand. Um, so I, was, I thought it was a great example of an interface. I was happy to see it there. Um, in fact, I was uh, at one point trying to see, can I change the book so that it uses JavaFX, which is a more modern graphical toolkit in Java. And JavaFX is not all that well designed. There, there wasn't any interface in the entire toolkit. And so I kind of gave up and said, you know, it might be more modern, but it's hard to teach with it. <coughs> all right, <coughs> so here we have J component. We just paint here in the, in the normal way. So as an uh, uh, advantage over using icon is now we inherit a bunch of stuff. And that's why I wanted to uh, contrast this. When previously, when you had this icon saying it is something as an icon, because our icon is an interface, it, had, it has essentially no behavior. You're not getting anything for free. Not the American way. So here, we are extending J component, and now J component gives us, I think, 200 methods, literally 200 methods. And one of the ones that's interesting for us is to attach mouse movements. So uh, uh, a J component listens to mouse movements, and now I can do the same thing simply by inheriting from it. So that's nice. So here is how you deal with mouse listeners. Um, <coughs> there is two interfaces actually, one for <coughs> mouse listener and one for mouse motion listener because um, mice just can't do a lot of stuff. And depending on whether the mouse was pressed or released, you, you, uh, this method is called to enter or exit in the component. This method is called, um, and <coughs> if the mouse was clicked, means it was both pressed and released, then the press, the release, and then the click method are called. For uh, this course, I don't think we ever need anything other than then press. But I could be wrong, maybe we'll need that one some way. Um, things like mouse and mouse enter and mouse exited are used if you want a button to light up when the mouse enters it, for example. And the click just could be potentially useful, although I've never ever used it, um, so that you don't have to worry about tracking press and release. But I, I yeah. press tends to be the thing. Then there's a separate interface for mouse motion. And the idea is that Motion is more costly to listen to, and so they didn't, for whatever reason, they didn't want to uh, make those callbacks unless they're really uh, requested. And so you get to know when the mouse was moved, and so those uh, events come fast and furious, or when the mouse was moved while the button was clicked. Now, normally, you don't really want to implement all of these methods. This was all done before there were default methods. And so the trick that they used uh, is they made a, what they call an adapter class for these listeners that has all of them de defined as do nothing. Nowadays, we wouldn't do that anymore. We would have just defined them as default methods in the interface to do nothing. But that was not available for 20 years. <coughs> so if you want to do something, um, let's say you want to know where the mouse was pressed, you extend the mouse adapter. And I think I have, yes, um, you don't want the set of uh, phrases here. You can take that out. And then you override just one method, the mouse press method here, and you put whatever it is that you want to have happen when the mouse gets pressed. Um, and the other methods then are automatically doing nothing here. Um, notice that you cannot do this with lambda expressions. You actually have to define a class. Why can't you do it with lambda expressions? So previously, all of the event listeners that we had, listening to a button, to a slider, whatever, we always boldly used the lambda expression. Yes? Because lambda expressions only work in the class, and that's one method that's not already default. That's correct. Right. So uh, lambda expressions, you have to have a single abstract method. Now, for these interfaces here, you have more than one abstract method. So maybe if one had designed this uh, in 2017, one would not have to use the interfaces like this. One would have instead just supply more interfaces because the lambda expressions are pretty nice. Um, but as it is, uh, whenever you use mouse handling, you have to go back in time and use the old-fashioned way of, de of defining these handles. And so here's a typical example of this. Let me just run this program. So I have a car shape here and 
So the car, it's the same old shape that I had before, except this, it's just very basic. It has a method contains, it has a method translate to move it. Um, and we'll see in a minute why it has those. Oh, let me run it first. So as you can see, I can now drag this car around. Okay, it's so cool. Um, so how does one do something like this? Let's, um, there's, the, the, this thing is just the class that starts up the frame. There's nothing in here. The interesting stuff here happens in the car component. So it extends J component. It puts a car somewhere there. Now it adds a mouse listener and a mouse motion listener. Um, in the mouse listener, we want to know where the mouse went down. So you can see that we're storing the, uh, wherever the mouse went down in mouse point. And we're using this contains method here for the car. Um, if the mouse didn't go over anywhere interesting, not anywhere inside the car, then mouse point is set to null. Now in mouse dragged, if mouse point is null, that means that previously one clicked somewhere outside. Uh, every drag has to be preceded by a press. So right now, uh, I'm going to be pressing the mouse button, and now I'm going to be dragging. And now nothing happens because the mouse point is null. If, on the other hand, I'm inside here, then the thing moves. And let's see what happens here. I'm setting the mouse point to my, my new location, and I have the old and the new one. Let me just So let's say previously I clicked here. And now I'm dragging the mouse so that I'm now here. Then I'm computing the difference between the old one and the new one in X and Y. And then I'm translating by that difference. Why do I make myself that trouble? Why don't I simply put the car where the mouse is? Couldn't I simply just uh, take this car and just call it set X, set Y, or set bounds, or something, so that it's where the mouse is? Because that's what people normally do when they first implement. So if I were to change this here, fact. Probably do this really quickly. Yes. So let me mess with this and oops. How wide is the car? <coughs> um, 50. Car cannot, oh, car shape. I know this must be an inch, or a pain. So now I'm going to run this. So now I'm going to click inside here. What happened? Moves it to the top left. Yes. So that is the problem. Was now I can't even now I've dragged it away. Oh, actually, let me do that one more time. I guess you can just always drag it away. Yeah, so you can see now the mouse is always at the top left. And that's not as natural um, as what's really in the code here. <coughs> you 
where you can see the mouse pointer always retains its relative position. All right, so that's why it's done like that. And that's why I messed with the class so that it has this translate method to move and buy a certain amount as opposed to to a certain amount. All right. Um, now on to the interesting part. Uh, for the yeah. mouse drag, is that like every time you move a certain amount of pixels, it sends an event that you... It sends it whenever it feels like it. Uh, so I, I don't really know how they figure out how often they send one. Um, and it kind of de also depends a little bit on how busy the whole system is. So um, to be responsive, any graphical user interface system will try to coalesce unimportant events. And so if it finds, like, uh, for example, if it calls uh, paint and then it calls paint again, while the first paint hasn't yet been done, it, the first one gets remo removed from the event queue. And the same thing is true for mouse motion. So if the mouse motions haven't been, uh, been taken out of the event queue, um, then they just get removed because the new information is more up to date. Is that a consumer producer model where some messages sometimes uh, doesn't <coughs> Well, it certainly is, uh, is cons uh, the messages are produced by this invisible part of Swing that deals with all of the events. Now, we don't really see that uh, as Swing programmers. We, we, are, we just know that this, these callbacks happen. Um, and so I'm not sure I would call it, <coughs> normally you call producer consumer if someone actively says, give me the next event, give me the next message, if they're actively pulled out of a queue. That's not the case in this callback. So you could imagine a different uh, way of, of doing it um, where you as the programmer would always have, have a loop where you keep pulling events out, but that's just not what we do in Swing. All right, um, moving on to the abstract classes, which is what, what I really care about. So we're gonna be having the silly scene editor here um, where we're gonna be adding a bunch of things to, to the scene here, and then we can drag them all around, and we can even remove some. Um, and, oops, uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna have to talk this through because I messed it up. So there is a superclass called scene shape that has a <coughs> uh, was it class or interface? I think I, uh, okay, I proposed it as an interface. I said, no, let, let's, let's say that there's an interface um, that has methods, is selected, set selected, but that's kind of wasteful. You don't really want to use interfaces for that because in the most natural implementation of that interface, you do need a flag. You need to have some data. An interface can never have data. That's, just, that's the one restriction on interfaces. You can, can't have instance variables. So in this case, an interface isn't quite the right choice. Instead, you want to make it a, a, what's called an abstract class. So over here, I'm making a class selectable shape that manages the selection bit. That's really all that it does right now. And it implements scene shape. And if you remember, scene shape was the that interface that I had from before. Scene shape had methods draw, draw selection, translate it. So now I have this class here that I want to add in this extra bit of functionality. It can't quite work like this because this class here implements an interface without implementing all of its methods. Of course, I could now implement all of the methods to do nothing. But that's not very natural. Instead, what I can do is I can declare it as abstract. So <coughs> I would then simply, oh, you can see it in the code here. I tag this thing as abstract, and then that's okay. In an, an abstract class doesn't have to have all of its methods defined. Now, when, when you look carefully here, you'll see that it, this is an abstract class, but it does have some concrete methods. That's fine. It also does have some abstract methods, some methods that are not defined, namely all of the ones that we pick up from scene shape. And that's typical for an abstract class. You could, in theory, have an abstract class that has no abstract methods. Um, at any rate, the point of an abstract class is that someone else has to form a subclass of it. And here we have two subclasses, car shape and house shape. You can see they extend 
this abstract selectable shape, and they implement the various methods that we need, like draw. Draw selection contains and translate. Draw selection, by the way, is, is the one that somehow decorates this thing as being selected. Let me show you how this program does. Um, so let's make a new, a new house and a new car. And now I'm going to move this car somewhere. Oops, I'm, I'm now moving both. That wasn't so good. <coughs> okay, there must be some way. Okay. And so each of these shapes needs to somehow <coughs> indicate to us whether it's currently selected. And the house fills its body and the car fills its body. But of course, that's not something that we, we can do generically. Or we can. We will actually do that in a different way later. But right now, I just wanted to make it so. And it is super unintuitive. Um, whatever. You, you need to play with it and, s and see why I say it's unintuitive. Um, And there's an exercise why, why that is so. So it's, it's, of course, like a really bad program. Um, but uh, that is there so that there's room for improvement on uh, Wednesday. All right, so that is, um, <coughs> so the one thing about abstract classes. Um, somehow, some students, when they first hear about abstract classes, think that abstract classes must somehow be very abstract, like, and difficult to understand. <laughs> but there's really nothing difficult to understand about an abstract class. An abstract class is a class that cannot be instantiated. That's all. No more, no less. So a class is abstract if you can't construct an object of the class. That's all that it means. And a class can be abstract for one of two reasons. One is because not all of its methods are defined. Then the compiler will enforce that, of, that you must declare it as abstract. Because of course, if there is a class where not all of the methods are defined, then it would be deadly to construct an object of that class. What if you call one of those undefined methods? So the other reason an abstract class can be abstract is just because you say it's abstract. So you can put abstract in front of any, any of your classes, and then that forces someone to make subclasses. Um, like you might make an abstract class employee, and then one couldn't make an employee, but that maybe your intent was that someone has to define subclasses like janitor and manager and so on. and. Uh, that's not very common. Um, I do know one example, but I did know one example, but I can't remember it right now. Um, okay, I'll have to think about it. So, somewhere in the Java library, there's actually one class that that you might want to use that that's that's impl that's defined as abstract. Normally, abstract really means one or more, more methods not implemented. All right. So when when do you use an abstract class, and when you use an interface class uh, interface type? That's very, very simple. <coughs> you should always use an interface type if you can. Interfaces are nicer and cleaner and simpler. But you must use an abstract class when you have fields. So in selectable shape, we wanted to have that Boolean for selected. That's a field that forced us into an abstract class. So that's, that's the simplest rule. Why are interfaces better? Because a class can implement as many interfaces as you like. But a class can extend only one class. And so why have that restriction unless you, ooh, 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 ooh. this slide hasn't been updated. Uh, what's wrong on this slide? They can do default methods now. Yeah, so now, uh, so it used to be uh, before Java 8 that this was true, right? Abstract classes can define methods, interfaces can, can only declare methods. Nowadays, interfaces can, def can implement methods just fine. They're called default methods, but they're regular old methods. And so this is not a problem. OK, I'm better. And they're static. Yeah, um, but uh, I guess static methods are, uh, are always an oddball case that, uh, uh, like, they don't inherit. And so you would never, in a design, rely on static methods for doing uh, anything other than maybe a factory or something. So yes, you can have static methods in, in, in classes and in interfaces, nowadays anyway. 
Ah. And that was the scene editor. All right, that's all that, that we need to do now. So now what I would like to do in the last uh, 18 minutes or so is go back to that unfinished lab from last time um, about that sequence diagram. So if you could find the buddy that you had last time or any old buddy, and let me show you where I want to get back to because I really want to make sure that everyone gets that point. Um, So we talked about these lambdas, and what we talked about is that when you, that what happens when a lambda is being made, that it actually calls a constructor. And now, if you can go to the exam question, and you can skip one and two, we, um, I don't care about that. But then go into question three and draw this arrow. Then draw the next arrow and go as far as you can. And then we'll do it all together. You need to look at the exam, yeah. Yeah, I mean, can we just build off the answer that you put on the exam? That you put, if, if it's that good. <laughs> you can try. Um, I mean, a lot of people have trouble with the exam, so. 